of things that rotate and the aerodynamics associated with that uh, needs to evolve rather quickly. Uh, the other motivation is that uh, the industry is kind of forcing OEMs to electrify their portfolios. And with that uh, brings increase in vehicle mass driven by battery uh, mass, also increase in wheel tire section width uh, to support the additional torque uh, from these electric motors and of course a decrease in rolling resistance. Uh, design trends are moving more toward more aero efficient shapes, uh, not just from performance, but, but also from an, an aesthetic value. And then finally, um, as you probably have seen, that we're shifting more from sedans to utility vehicles, uh, which drives the desire for a larger wheel diameter. Uh, so I just pulled two examples out of our portfolio. We have the uh, ICE engine Sonic, uh, Chevy Sonic, compared to an uh, all-electric Chevy Bolt. You'll see the difference in mass, even though the Bolt is a little bit bigger in size, the battery pack is quite a bit more heavy uh, at the 435 versus the 32. But the last thing is the most important part, I think, is the difference in torque. So you'll see the Sonic at a torque of about 200 newton meters compared to the torque from a Bolt. Um, at 3, 360, that's normally 200 foot pounds of torque, uh, which is a lot for a car this size. So you'll see that we had to upsize uh, the section with in order to, to maintain that. If you're still not convinced, uh, Model X Tesla, uh, very well known, air efficient shaped vehicle. Uh, these are the tiring wheel offerings. So you have a 20 inch at 265, and then you have a 22 inch at 285. 10 years ago, these were tech, uh, truck tires. So we're putting truck tires on <laughs> midsize. Uh, SUVs, so that drives a lot of efficiencies in the, in the wheel area. So, again, the research over the years, the research in the past two hours is vast, uh, as you've seen before in some of the prior papers today. Uh, we've been looking at this for a long time. Um, I think Eleanor made mention of the Freckwell and, and Harvey paper. It's a very popular one. Uh, a lot of you recognize this picture here. But uh, this is in 1974, so I was two years old. So <laughs> north of 40 years, we've been looking at this problem. So I'm not looking to revolutionize uh, the, the, this problem. We've looked at it before, both in the computational domain, empirical domain, also, um, you know, the, the research is out there. So these are some examples. But the motivation here is that uh, I like this quote uh, that not only are qualitative solutions important, being able to predict how something is going to perform, but also having a qualitative or intuitive understanding uh, of what's happening uh, to drive a solution uh, that creates a sound design. So that intuitive understanding of the mechanisms that drive wheel aero is important. Uh, so the aero engineer needs a, a pretty good understanding of the mechanisms that govern the interaction between the surfaces and the uh, aerodynamic forces. Uh, he or she needs a tool set of uh, design enablers that will exploit the advantages and mitigate the disadvantages of these mechanisms uh, in order to maintain a structural and aesthetically uh, pleasing uh, final design. So this loop here kind of shows like my daily life here, which is the, the aero engineer I have to interact with structural mass engineers and then also of course the design studio so as we go around this design loop several times, you need a really good understanding of the mechanisms and enablers in order to offset some of the, the, the challenging uh, deliverables. So my approach is a little different. Uh, I kind of approached it from a control systems uh, block diagram approach where you identified all the components that influence the, uh, the, the response of the input to the output, which is the aerodynamic force. So we have the body exterior, uh, we have the wheel liner, and inside that is the tire and spoke. And then depending on how much interaction you, you have between the, the wheel liner, uh, the tire, the spoke, and the body, those interactions can feed back and actually adjust how the body um, is responding to the, the free stream velocity. And of course, because the, the, the vehicle is moving, uh, you have the angular velocity of the wheel uh, driven by the dynamic wheel radius. So um, in control systems, what you do is you create a frequency response function. So you vary the frequency and you watch how the system responds. So we know what happens at zero or static, and we kind of know what happens at, when it's moving. Uh, so what happens in between? Is there some sort of resonance that happens, that happens between the mechanisms that drive the aerodynamic forces or what? I think that our thought that 
getting a better understanding of this would help me understand the mechanisms, how they scale and how they interact. So that's the novelty here. Um, so uh, we actually started the experiment uh, in the tunnel, both in full scale and five belt reduced scale. Uh, but I decided to create a small quarter model to kind of really extract uh, some of the interactions and really vet uh, the mechanisms that were going on. So I'm not looking to impress anybody that has a CFD background. It's a very simple uh, RANS 2 parameter capsulon model uh, refinement box. And what I did is I created a simplified vehicle body shape. These studs represent what would be lower and upper control arms. I have a tire, uh, and then I have a rotor, and then I have a spoke, which includes the rim. And then I'm modeling the uh, swept volume with an MRF. So this first plot kind of shows the results here. So in the y-axis I have drag force, in the x-axis I have the angular velocity uh, of the wheel. So 90 radians per second kind of represents uh, what the wheel needs to spin at at, at the 110 kph uh, free stream velocity. And as expected, you know, you'll see that, the, sorry, the drag did decrease uh, with increasing angular velocity. But you'll notice here that the actual force on the body increased slightly and then it reached a point to where it then actually, after that, it started to decrease. Now you'll notice that we did overspin uh, the wheel beyond the 90. Um, that's not a realistic case that you would see in the real world, at least not legally. That's like a burnout or something like that. Uh, but the, the whole point here is to change the input and track the response. We also spent the, um, the wheel backwards just to, to see how the, the, the system responds. So if I take that plot and just compare, this is delta drag force uh, compared to as a percentage static. So you see as you start to increase your, your real angular velocity, uh, the different components react in different ways. So most notably is the tire, of course. Uh, it has the biggest percent change compared to stationary compared to some of the other components. But remember the magnitude of the tire overall force uh, was small relative to some of the other components, so the overall impact was smaller. Um, same plot, just drawing back a little bit, uh, all the way out to the 180 radians per second, you'll see a change happens right after the 90. So from zero to 90 radians per second, the total vehicle drag was dominated by the wheel. No surprises there. But then, and then the wheel, um, total wheel aerodynamics was uh, aerodynamic force was dominated uh, by the spoke slash rim. Once you begin to overspin the wheel, that change, where then the total aerodynamic drag was driven more by the vehicle body, and the wheel uh, total drag was uh, driven by the tire. So I just use this to kind of help, out. refer to quadrants one, two, three, and four, just to kind of uh, help us navigate what region I'm talking about. Uh, but just remember this plot with look through some of these other slides. So this is static pressure, uh, surface pressures on the uh, spoke slash rim at different uh, wheel RPMs, zero to 180. So you'll see here, uh, fluids traveling from left to right, mean fluids traveling left to right. You have a stagnation here on the back side of the rim uh, that reduces once you start spinning the wheel. And then as you overspin the wheel, you'll see localized stagnation points in, in front of each spoke. So I want to spend a, a, a little time on this particular chart here in that it kind of illustrates exactly what's happening. So I superimposed on top of the static pressure, uh, isosurface total pressure equal to zero to kind of get an understanding of wake structures and mechanisms. So you see here statically, you'll see first of all, the air wants to separate uh, from the, the tire rubber or the shoulder uh, and create this uh, tire wall wake. Uh, you have the weight caused by the air exiting uh, the gap between the tire and the cavity. As you begin to spin the wheel, now remember in quadrants one and two, the tangent velocity of the rubber uh, tire is spinning in the opposite direction of the free stream velocity. So that creates premature separation uh, off the tire face a wall, causing the size of these tire wall wicks to increase in size. And of course, you'll see at 90, it, it happens even uh, earlier, and then of course at 180, it, it starts immediately. Also, I want to illustrate here the tire patch wake, the size of it as it increases, or sorry, decreases in size as you begin to increase the angular velocity uh, of the wheel. 
And then as you see, if, if you overspin it, the, the tire patch weight reduces greatly in size, size compared to the fixed condition. So same plot, just took off the ISO surfaces again. Uh, I just want to make mention here of this uh, suction peak here. So of course, as, as was highlighted, highlighted earlier, you have a stagnation at the patch uh, as the tire rubber uh, meets the ground. And then as the air leaves that stagnation, it has to accelerate due to streamline contraction. Uh, and if it stays attached, uh, that high velocity flow will impinge on the swept volume uh, of the rotating wheel. Now, depending on the level of impingement inside this swept volume, it could uh, act against the backside of the rim and also the backside of the wheel liner, causing a lot of vehicle body drag. So then if you uh, superimpose back the isosurfaces of the wake, you'll see that you have this valley here of high velocity potential flow. Uh, and this is what's dangerous here. Uh, so you want to eliminate or minimize the amount of impingement of this high velocity flow into this valley because it causes a lot of impingement and drag. So again, just to kind of summarize the, the, the naming convention I'm, I'm using. So I'm using gap weight to refer to the gap uh, weight caused by the air exiting the, the wool liner cavity, wall, tire wall separation weight, and then the patch weight, and of course the valley in between. So I found that another good way to sense impingement into the swept volume is important uh, to create a plane on the back and front side of the um, swept volume to track. This is wide velocity, so cross car velocity. So this is the speed at which the air is entering that swept volume. And you'll see uh, it enters right in that region where you have that suction peak where the air is accelerating uh, downstream of the stagnation patch. Now, I want to make mention here uh, so let me explain this one uh, here. So you'll see that the, this is the only time I set the free stream velocity to zero, uh, but I kept the angular velocity of the wheel at 90. So again, this is a static type burnout type, type of situation. And you'll see, again, this is not pressure, this is wide cross car velocity. That upstream of every spoke, the air um, is leaving the swept volume, and then downstream, it's, it's entering. So it's, what's happening, you have circulation, local circulation around each spoke as you begin to add angular momentum uh, to the system. Now, if you go back here where the mean velocity is 110 kph again, you'll see as I overspin and add angular momentum, that becomes dominant, and you'll start to see this spoke circulation up here. Uh, you can't forget about the other side. It's not the show side, but it is important. On the back side, the velocities are higher because you have to contract the, uh, the air, the mean velocity, so the velocities in the underbody are higher. Uh, so I, I did the same thing on the back side. So you'll see uh, the flow exits, uh, the swept volume uh, right around 11 o'clock. Uh, that pretty much stays constant and it slightly drifts downward uh, as you increase the angle of momentum. So because we can't change the angular velocity uh, short of making the the wheel size bigger or smaller, I decided to change the geometry. Keep the angular velocity at 90 radius per second, but just change the velocity any way I could just to create some variation in the system. So again, I took a rounded shoulder and made it square. I took a rounded spoke and made it square. But important here to note is that I changed the pitch or the angle of that square spoke. So uh, I call it recessed, which is orange, and then the purple one I called angle, where the tips of the the square spoke are kind of sticking out toward the edges of the wheel room. So this plot kind of compares the, the baseline case, which is the rounded uh, angle spoke, uh, and then the orange one is the, the square spoke that's uh, recessed, and then the yellow or gold is the square spoke with the tips sticking out a little bit. So if you look at this from 10,000 feet, the thing that brings, uh, attracts your attention is this big difference here which I kind of expected. You know, I, I made everything square, so inherently I increased the drag. Okay, no revelation there. But what I thought was interesting is that as I changed the pitch or angle of the square spoke, I started to, again, reclaim some of the aerodynamic forces on the components that I saw when the geometry was more rounded. I thought that was interesting, so try to figure out why that was. So uh, on the left, you have the, both are square, 
uh, spokes. One's recessed and then the other one is angled. Uh, you'll see all of the notable things here, the tire wall wakes, the gap wakes, and then the patch wake. But look at the difference in the patch wake when you change the angle of the spoke. Again, that's the only thing changing is the angle of the spoke. All the geometry is, is the same uh, otherwise. So we kind of expected this where the flow is impinging uh, into the swept volume. But notice also too, as I pitch the angle of the squared spoke, I start seeing that spoke circulation again. So it, it, it has a factor in determining not only the localized airflow around this region, quadrants one and four, but it also can, can change the shape and magnitude of the patch wake. This just shows you also, uh, I decided to kind of look on the inboard side, the non-show side. Again, this is the recessed spoke, and then this is the rounded baseline case, just for comparison pur pur purposes, but you'll see that the flow actually overexpanded and lifted and hit one of these lower control arm studs and actually the inboard side of the wheel liner creating a lot of drag. Remember that big peak going from the round into the square. And then the air actually exits the wheel liner as opposed to going in in the rounded baseline case. So what's happening is, is that the air accelerates under the vehicle. It's introduced to this large expansion in the wheel liner and then that expansion causes the flow to lift. Now if you track again the wide cross car velocities coming out of the swept volume, you'll notice that in the angle spoke case, you'll have it, in, let's say maybe at eight, eight o'clock, but at the recess spoke point, the air exits the swept volume at a lower uh, angle. So that probably helped with the over expansion of the flow and the lifting of the flow, creating all of the impingement on the lower control arm studs in the back side of the wheel liner. So these last slides are just summary slides. This is not in the paper, but I thought graphically it can illustrate kind of the summation of, of what's going on. So the more important quadrants are quadrants three and four, because remember that valley I talked about? So this is just something that the production engineer or aero engineer needs to be aware of. Uh, tire patch stagnation. Um, creates this tire wall acceleration that we saw down in this region. And then as a result of that, depending on the shape of the shoulder, can create enough angularity in this high velocity flow to impinge on the swept volume, which would then cause problems downstream. And then of course, spoke, spoke circulation can affect how that air uh, um, moves around this lower portion of the wheel and change the drag by a lot. Uh, up high, again, remember we had the tire wall wake and the gap wake. Um, it's all separated. The best you can do is just to reduce the size of these wakes by delaying the separation. Uh, there's papers out there with tire lettering, et cetera, uh, tread on the shoulder. All those just speak to controlling the tire wall separation in those areas and reducing the size of the wakes. And then on the inboard side, again, the velocities are higher down low because of the contraction caused by the underbody. The flow has to get under the underbody so it accelerates and then it's exposed to this expansion. So you have high levels of vorticity, of course, because of the velocity gradients down in this region here. Uh, but also as the air exits, you have to control how it exits that uh, swept volume and influences how that expansion of that underbody flow into the wheel liner uh, is, is controlled. Uh, didn't see much up here. I talk a lot about what happens in here, how the flow oscill oscillates up the tire uh, tread face uh, and then exits, uh, but not much to really affect the drag. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, we welcome questions from the floor. If you have a question, if you could step up to the microphone and state your name and affiliation. process everything you talked about here, um, but it got me thinking, and I'm going to pose a question to you. Um, so if, if you consider a vehicle which drives in regular winds, right, so it's rare that you're actually driving in wind conditions, so typically you might have a head or tail, right, which means that the ratio of that kind of spinning wheel um, to the sort of forward velocity of yeah, the vehicle, vehicle kind of changes, probably not to the same extremes that you looked at, but right. maybe like 10 to 20%. 
this what you we've identified could this potentially have implications for design looking at these sort of wing sort of head and tail wing conditions like could you design a, a wheel setup that uh, maybe has a, a greater advantage over a wider range of wing conditions yeah i think the wind averaging or even head wind and tail wind the relative velocity between the mean uh, uh, the infinity and the angular mo momentum of the wheel swept volume does play a part. So if you, uh, with a headwind, can change that, either reduce it or increase it, that will increase the influence of the swept volume momentum. Let's say, for instance, in a, uh, in a headwind, I think, probably um, the angular momentum inside the swept volume will then start to try to dominate the mean flow. So then I think the effect of the wheel will become greater. Okay. Yeah, that's Thanks. a good point. Hi, Nick Evans with uh, Toyota. I think on slide 22 or so, um, you compared the flat spoke to the rounded spoke, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, the recess to the deep spoke. Mm -hmm. um, can you comment if you think that the maybe system drag reduction you saw there was maybe more influenced by the change in flow in the front section there where you had airflow going in, or if it was affected more by the more airflow going into the rear? Now, when you say front and rear, you mean of the of vehicle the, body? I guess quadrants two and one, or three and one. Three. Maybe you show on the, the graph on the other page. Okay. Sorry. You, you have the, the red zones there. Uh -huh. um, it looks like the red zone is reduced in B on the uh, square angle spokes. Would that not indicate less airflow? spokes if you will? Yeah, that's exactly what it means. Yes. Yeah. So then on the on the back you have more into the wheel spokes. Do you think which one of those do you think is more of a can like the reason why the drag is reduced potentially? Yeah, I'm thinking uh, that's a good question. So um, I think this kind of alludes to the circulation around the individual spokes. But I looked at the this plot here to kind of track well if it's entering up high why is it uh, exiting down the wall? Um, I wasn't able to, that's future work that I wanted to kind of investigate that, but that's kind of the, the thinking that you have to kind of go after. You know, why is it entering such, you know, at a high, uh, let's say, angle and exiting down low? Maybe that has a lot to do with the, the angular momentum. Uh, if you look at some of these plots here, I don't know if you can see it here, but, uh, on the rounded case, once the air enters the swept volume, it does start to circulate and follow the momentum, angular momentum, and it may not exit where you think it would, just due to the angular momentum. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh. Well, maybe I'll just stand here. Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. <laughs> Gary Els from UIT. It's an interesting uh, study you've done. Could you use this to investigate different inside shapes of the wheel well as well? Uh, have you looked at that even? Right, that's the yeah. key. Yeah. So a lot of times we pay a lot of attention to the show side uh, or the spoke design and ignore the wheel liner inside the wheel liner and also the uh, inboard side of the wheel. Uh, so that's kind of the conclusion of this is that you can't ignore the shape of the wheel liner inside as well as the tire shape, uh, the spoke shape, the wheel liner shape and that, how you design that cavity. And I'm sure everyone in here probably can think of a thousand ways <laughs> to manipulate the flow in this area using just the wheel liner. Yeah. Yeah, that's the key. Yeah. 